All right, you ready for this? Ready. Welcome to the first Device Talks Weekly podcast of 2021. Quite a start to the new year. I had a few relaxing weeks off. I hope you did as well. But uh, we're here to talk medtech. We're going to speak this week with John Norris. John's a managing director of the healthcare practice at Silicon Valley Bank. He is an excellent tracker of all financial information regarding the healthcare industry, including medtech. So we're going to talk today about Silicon Valley Bank's wrap up of 2020. We'll look back a bit. It's been an interesting year. Saw some uh, really surprising increases in fundraising and deals being done and some uh, really promising exiting data as well. So I'll get to into that with John. Then I'll speak with uh, Rob Cowell. Rob is the Vice President of Medical Affairs and the CMO for the Cardiac Rhythm and Heart Failure Group at Medtronic. Rob is a cardiac electrophysiologist by training. He uh, left the practice to join Medtronic a few years ago. We'll talk about that transition, but we'll also talk about the promise of remote connectivity for medical devices. Of course, we'll, we'll hit upon 2020. In fact, this interview was recorded in December, late December. It was actually my last interview of, uh, of 2020 a few hours before I was going on break. So uh, Rob was a a great way for me to end the year, and I know you'll enjoy that conversation. Before I bring in my podcast partner, Chris Newmark, I do want to let you know we'll be restarting Device Talks Tuesdays on January 19th. Go to devicetalks.com. We're uh, rolling out a conversation about innovating in 2021, and then we'll uh, bring in a long line of uh, great partners and sponsors, starting with Sagentia, and uh, they'll be talking about different ways to uh, to create medical devices, to improve your processes, and to work better in 2021. So make sure you go to devicetalks.com. We'll be filling out that uh, lineup of Device Talks Tuesdays shortly. So uh, go to devicetalks.com for more information. All right. Well, of course, I'm here with my podcast partner, Chris Newmarker, Executive Editor of Life Sciences at Mass Device and Medical Design and Outsourcing. Chris Newmarker, how are you, sir? Hey, man. Well, here we are, 2021. Wow. It certainly didn't didn't start off as we uh, perhaps anticipated, or perhaps we should have anticipated it, but uh, it's been a bit rocky. Uh, we will get into MedTech talk in just a moment, but uh, it's hard not to talk just for a moment, uh, a few minutes about what happened this week. Uh, you... I uh, have an article on uh, medical design and outsourcing put together by Nancy Crotty, yeah. managing director there, about uh, MedTech taking a stand. Tell us a little bit about the article. Well, I mean, you know, generally, um, you know, companies and, and trade groups are, are loath to be like overly uh, political. Uh, but I mean, I mean, frankly, like uh, like a, a, a mob storming the, the U.S. Capitol is, um, I mean, I mean, frankly, it's. I mean, I, I actually, um, like right after college, started a journalism internship in D.C., uh, you know, a week um, a week before 9-11. And uh, I, uh, I I got to see the smoke from the Pentagon in the distance and the smoke going over the city and, and people uh, panicking and, and leaving the leaving the city. And uh, frankly, seeing the U.S. Capitol stormed, um, I, I, I think that it's that's probably the worst thing I've seen since then. So it's yeah, just uh, a really sad, sad moment for for our country it's a fair comparison and and unlike that moment which united us uh this one really is uh drawing some sharp lines between our divisions we have a lot of a lot of healing to do so uh yeah we just kind of try to you know i i we i know we we're talking about med tech here we shouldn't talk too much about politics but frankly like just you know try to figure out ways to get along better and, um, you know, be constructive. And, you know, and to that end, you know, we had, you know, a whole host of, uh, you know, med tech trade groups and companies and CEOs, you know, putting out statements, you know, condemning, you know, what happened, um, you know, I mean, you know, right here we have Scott Whitaker, the, uh, you know, the uh, head of Avamed, you know, saying that, you know, what happened did not represent who we are or who we should be as a nation mm-hmm. um, that, you know, we settle political differences by passionately, but peacefully seeking change in policy. You know, that, that, that's what kind of democracy is all about. We don't need to, you know, have uh, fights in the street. We, uh, you know, we, we, we try to, you know, like, you know, politely uh, debate things and figure things out. And, um, you know, uh, Jeff Martha, 
head of Medtronic, the largest uh, medical device company in the world, um, you know, saying that, you know, the, the peaceful transition of power has been a hallmark of American democracy for more than 200 years. And, you know, acknowledging that he himself is someone who's benefited immensely from the freedoms that we have here in the U.S., uh, and that, you know, we, we deserve better than, uh, you know, the chaos we're seeing in D.C. as a society and a nation. So comments from uh, Mark Leahy at, at MDMA. <laughs> yeah, direct, you know, check out the story at MDO. We got the whole the whole round of all these these comments. You know, exactly like, um, you know, MDMA. We got, uh, you know, Tom Pollan at uh, BD. We got Alex Gorski at uh, J&J. We got uh uh, you know, you know Jean Claude Duchere at uh, B Brown. Uh, you know, I think I think we're going to be throwing in a quote that uh, you know Bill George, the uh, for former Medtronic you know Med CEO, put out. Um, so you know a lot of um, I know after the uh, you know what happened with uh, George Floyd here in my hometown of Minneapolis, we uh, you know had a lot of uh, you know CEOs in the industry say you know we sometimes we should you know take more of a stand with. Uh, some issues that are really important to our employees and our customers. And um, I think, I think we're seeing that right now that, you know, they're, you know, kind of, um, you know, it's, it's hard to be controversial. You're just saying like, you want to, you know, keep this wonderful, beautiful experiment of democracy that we have, uh, you know, going on in this country. Absolutely. No, and this, this does feel very much like that with, with people stepping forward and making comments that need to be made. The Advomed position is, is, Perfect, and it's uh, and it was it's not unexpected. It, it's interesting though because I did talk with Kevin Lobo in December for our uh, cover story for MDO, and uh, asked whether Advomed had he's the chairman of Advomed, and, and asked whether the organization had considered making a statement about the transition at the time, which was uh, of course in dispute. And uh, at the time, Advomed was was holding back and, and saying it, it didn't want to to get involved in that point, but it. At, it's clear after yesterday that something had to be said. So I'm, I'm glad they came forward. I'm glad others came forward. Uh, I don't know what the impact will be, but but these words certainly need to be out there. Yeah, totally. And uh, yeah, I mean, here's just hoping that we uh, we can like move on and uh, you know have some, you know have some better times as a country. It's been a really really tough past year. Absolutely. Well, that's uh, we'll we'll be tracking that and hopefully won't be talking having to talk about it again in a future podcast. I really hope so. We're always here to talk about devices. We are device talks. And you know the thing is, even as all this this happened, uh, we still had news this week. Uh, you know, I mean, and, uh, and actually there were you know two uh, you know two major M and A deals in the uh, in the ortho space. Uh, we had uh, you know we had uh, you know Smith and Nephew. They uh, closed their uh, their buy of uh, Integra Life Sciences uh, extremity business. And then we had, uh, you know, Stryker acquiring uh, Ortho and its knee surgery sensor tech that, uh, you know, Stryker has already been, you know, using this some. And now they're, now that they've acquired the company, they're, uh, you know, looking to like incorporate this a lot in their, their Mako robots, which have been hugely successful. So, I mean, that's actually mm-hmm. really big news for uh, Stryker. It's, um, it's, it's interesting. I mean, the Ortho space among all the spaces in med tech probably had one of the hardest times of the pandemic because... I mean, why go to if, if you have a choice of getting a knee surgery? Why go to a hospital? You know, when there's this deadly pandemic. Um, but you know, kind of this time, it seems to have been a good time for a lot of executives in the ortho space to really look and say, like, gosh, what can we buy? What can we, you know, what, yeah. what can we do here to emerge from this more uh, more efficient with uh, more offerings? So. Maybe there was a belief that you know now is the time to uh, to grow. The attract the prices on these properties might have been more attractive, given the pressure was felt by everybody. Oh, like get more deals. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it is certainly an interesting time, and it's fascinating to see the extremity space almost get the uh, kind of an arms race going on. That's going to be. It's always been talked about as as the next big thing, and we're clearly there. We've we've arrived. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, another piece of big news this week, just to mention really quick, um, two years ago, um, Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, JP Morgan Chase, they said, we're, you know, forming this joint healthcare venture haven. We are going to like, you know, really, you know, change the way, you know, healthcare is uh, handled in the United States. Uh, you know, there's even talk this might, you know, shake up the health insurance market in the United States. Two years later, uh, yeah. it's, it, they're, they're disbanding it. It's done. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm a huge fan of uh, Atul Gawande, and, and and when he was named CEO, it was fascinating. But you almost wish they did something poor because they didn't seem to do anything at all. I don't know what ever came from that effort. To I don't recall any papers. I don't recall any positions, any programs, anything that really created any sort of stir. So, yeah, maybe it's just a a, a good. 
you know, a good uh, example of like partnerships can be hard. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it um, just just didn't take off, just didn't have the promise people thought it would. Uh, you know, Atul Gawande, who just mentioned, you know, was the CEO for a while, but, you know, left, uh, you know, in, in, in May last year. And, you know, now he's, you know, he, he's moved on to some more important things like Absolutely. joining Biden's task force to you know, try to get us out of this, uh, you know, COVID problem. And I'm sh- I'm sure he'll he'll write another excellent book on it as well. He's the the, the man, man is, is the treasure. Yeah, so so he's doing some important, really important stuff. So, but uh, but yeah, so that's uh, so much for that effort. Oh, okay. Well, that certainly was some some news this week. We'll have a slightly uh, consolidated uh, news markers, newsmakers. Those are our good three top stories. We will bring them back. We will have the new markers and newsmakers. <laughs> we had some other news that unfortunately w- was was made and was then had to be talked about. But uh, and you know what, Tom? When we do this next week, I, I'm hoping that I can like celebrate my uh, alma mater, Ohio State, just like trashing Bama. I just hope that's my <laughs> wish. Just you know, that'll be that'll be just like there'll just be some joy inside of me. I look forward to that positive energy. Maybe we should record this podcast during the game so we can get it. Yeah, fresh. there you go. <laughs> If they lose, let's just not do it next week. All right, now it's time for our opening keep note conversation. As I said up top, I had a chance to speak yesterday on Thursday with John Norris. He's managing director of the healthcare practice at Silicon Valley Bank. John is a, a great resource for fundraising and financial data for all of healthcare. But uh, we, of course, talk, him, talk to him specifically about medical devices. So now let's hear from John Norris of Silicon Valley Bank. John Norris, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Tom. Great to be here. It's uh, our first podcast of 2021. We'll be looking forward from here on in, but we want to take one last long look at 2020. And uh, and we, I guess I was going to say say good riddance, but it was a good year in financial ways, a horrible year in many other real ways. But you have some interesting numbers from your report. Uh, just quickly, give uh, give our listeners an idea of, of what the report is that you put out. Yeah. So th- thanks, Tom. Yeah, it's a report that looks at what's happening in the venture healthcare sector. So I kind of go into medical device, biopharma, tools and diagnostics, and health tech, and look at where are the dollars going in in terms of fundraising, and then how are those dollars being dispersed into companies? And then we also look at the exit activity and look at what's happening in M&A and how are IPOs doing. So, you know, to your point, 2020 was a pretty incredible year. So this covers all of healthcare. I'll tweet out the report so folks can find it at MedTech Tom. I'll also put it on LinkedIn and we'll have it on our, our website. So anyone who wants to check it out can find it there. But uh, what are, let's go over some 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 major takeaways related just to the, the MedTech world from, uh, from your work. Sure. I think, you know, there's probably three major takeaways that can be applied across all sectors, but maybe I'll, I'll focus on, on med device for it. Yeah, the first one is on the healthcare venture fundraising side. I'll look at all the funds that are being uh, raised on a yearly basis and try and allocate, you know, how much dollars are actually going to be invested in healthcare by those funds. Mm -hmm. And for the pure uh, healthcare funds like Equesta or, you know, Versana, et cetera, you know, those are all healthcare 100%. And then you have the firms like an NEA who does tech and healthcare. And I'll just apportion what percentage in healthcare I think they're going to be investing. So mm-hmm. if you look at those numbers on a yearly basis, the last three or four years were around $9 billion up to $10 billion on a yearly basis, which were really big numbers in, in the grand scheme of things. But 2020, the number was $16.8 billion. So a 57% increase in venture fundraising. And, you know, you're seeing a lot more of these, uh, you know, tech and generalist investors that are investing in healthcare, but on the life science side, you're not necessarily seeing the funds and more life science funds. You're just seeing those fund sizes grow. Mm -hmm. And not only are they growing, but you're also seeing a lot of these venture funds that are raising these opportunity type funds to really take advantage of, the winners that they see in their portfolio, or to maybe get into late stage deals that they uh, they couldn't get into in the past. But if you look on the device side, you know I think it's kind of interesting just on the venture firm side to see a number of these firms that have raised pretty recently that are med tech focused. Um, when you think about companies like you know Saunder or Shang Bay or Mensana mm-hmm. or Trio, 
it's pretty interesting to see. There's a lot more med tech focused uh, investors that are out there. So that was not the first key takeaway was venture fundraising is up. So there's a lot of capital out there to be invested in companies. And these are some great, you, you mentioned Sonder, you mentioned Vinsana and Sonder, Fred Mall is, is part of that. Vinsana is Justin Klein and Kirk Nielsen. These, these are these are real, real experts in this field. They're they're amazing investors. Yeah, absolutely. And you do see, you know, you have seen sort of transition over the last decade um, from, you know, these are still maybe new names to some people, but these are savvy investors that have been out and about and are very, you know, mm-hmm. have great track records, but they've decided to, to either form new funds or move on and do their own thing. So, you know, a lot of capital out in the in the sector. But again, that sort of transitions into the second takeaway, which is dollars invested into companies. Right. So you have fundraising as one, the first big takeaway. The second big takeaway was investment into companies. Obviously, you know, we're, we're talking about 2020 as, you know, the year of COVID-19 and the pandemic and just, you know, obviously a really trying year for everybody. Um, but that didn't stop uh, dollars being deployed into companies. And so we did see a record dollars invested into venture-backed healthcare companies for U.S. and Europe. Uh, the previous record was $35 billion, and that was in 2018. Um, 2019 was a, pretty much the same number, right around 34. But in 2020, we jumped up to $51 billion. So an increase of 47% from 2019 in terms of dollars invested into companies in the U.S. and Europe. And if you break that down into device... You know, device was at 4.7 billion in US and Europe in 2018. That was pretty stable in 2019 at 4.8 billion, but then it, it jumped up to 5.4 billion this year. So more dollars going in. And just you know, two more quick points. One, when you think about the biggest quarter ever in healthcare history for dollars invested into companies was Q3 of this year, which really is an amazing benchmark. But the second highest ever was Q2 of this year. And this was during the lockdown, right? Everybody was at home. There were no face-to-face meetings. And I just think that that's, you know, it demonstrates the resilience of the healthcare sector. You know, it's a tightly networked industry, especially in device with a lot of repeat entrepreneurs. And just to be able to see the amount of activity that people were able to move forward with in a scenario where you couldn't have face-to-face mm-hmm. interactions, I thought was pretty pretty encouraging. Yeah, from your conversations, and I, I know you're having your your conference right now, and you must have had some conversations with clients and attendees, a virtual conference, of course. Do you get a, I mean, are people trying to time the market because there's a pandemic? People are trying to get, that doesn't seem to match what's gone on in the past. People very rarely try to, to commit dollars to go after an opportunity that's presented as a disease right there. And then I can't get my head around what the disconnect, not only in the cap, yeah. capital committed to companies, but also the capital committed to venture funds. Yeah, well, I think, I think it kind of balances out. And I, I agree with you that it's not necessarily people saying, oh, you know, I'm going to double down and just invest into, let's say, COVID-19 related, like respiratory issues or, or things of that nature on the device side. I think it's really mm-hmm. it's being pushed by the exit environment. And I think that's really sort of the, you know, the, third, the third takeaway, but it really is a factor for the first two because you know, venture funds can't raise unless you know, they show performance. Right. And, you know, they show performance by investing in the best companies and getting those companies to some sort of exit, either an M&A or IPO. And while, you know, I would say if you look at device as a as a whole, you know, M&A has been down a little bit. If you look at IPOs, that's another that's another scenario. What's uh, entirely you would think device, I would say, is probably the most Mm -hmm. impacted by the pandemic this year. If you think about sort of clinical trial delays and then just right. you know, elective and emergency procedures being down and affecting, you know, because frankly, most of these companies um, that are trying to IPO are revenue stories, right? And so when you're impacting revenue significantly, it's hard to think about how you do you get these companies public, but they did. And in fact, when you look at IPOs in the device arena, you know, there were nine IPOs in, um, in, in 2020, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, it was 11 IPOs in 2020. And <clears throat> that was up from 2018 and 19 that had eight each. But what's interesting is not only were pre-money valuations and dollars raised up, 
they were both 50% higher than what we saw for those median numbers in 2019. And so in 2020, the pre-money valuation was 469 million and they raised on a median uh, dollar number, 149 million in that IPO. Wow. You know, those are pretty heady valuations. Yet the bigger part of the story has been the aftermarket performance of these IPOs. So the 2020 class of IPOs, their average performance from when they went IPO through 1231 of this year mm-hmm. is plus 150%. That is the average. And actually, if you look across all healthcare sectors, that is the best performing sector in healthcare post IPO performance. And what's even more intriguing is because I know a lot of people in their mind are saying, oh, okay, yeah, maybe there's one or two companies that are up a thousand percent. And that just makes the average really amazing. But the median performance, so the middle IPO is up 111 percent in 2020. And, and, and you'd say, oh, well, you know, 2020 is an amazing year. But frankly, if you look at class of 2018, that was plus 172% from 2018 to now. And the class of 2019 is up 160% through the end of this last year. So the IPOs in device have been performing just amazingly well, even in the face of, you know, a lot of flack from, you know, difficulty getting procedures going. Difficult even getting into the operating room, you know, uh, the shutdown with the pandemic. And it's just, it's an amazing to see the performance that we're seeing in, the, in, that, in that IPO classes over the last three years. So, you know, despite the challenges, you know, the device companies have really sort of stood up and, uh, and, and shined during this period of time. Is then some of that uh, additional money into the companies are those crossover funds, mezzanine rounds that are going to look look forward, hoping to get similar success in 2021? Yeah, I think so. When you look at the dollars invested into device uh, in 2020, uh, Series A was down yeah. uh, a, a decent amount. The vast majority, so it was a record dollars, but the record dollars were really late stage focused. And I think what you saw, at least in the early part of 2020, was the fear of all these companies that actually were thinking about going IPO all of a sudden realizing that you know, their revenue forecasts could potentially be pretty severely impacted and maybe it's not such a good idea mm-hmm. to think about an IPO. Maybe it's better to raise some additional capital to make sure that they, they have enough funds. And so we did see a number of these folks go out and sort of raise additional mezzanine rounds and instead of maybe going IPO, raising more, more, more capital. But then you know, finding that the IPO window was open and then still going out in the same year in 2020 and performing quite well. So I think in 2021, you're going to see, you know, mezzanine rounds continuing to be uh, uh, where the majority of dollars are going for the sector. And that's because, you know, look at all this great IPO performance. Mm-hmm. Um, why, why do crossovers do these mez rounds? Because they want to get in at a lower valuation than IPO but also get a placeholder so that at the IPO, they can put in as much money as they can in that IPO. And so both of those functions are working out really well, especially when you're seeing all this great post-IPO performance. So the final point I want to hit on the exiting front is M&A. Before I do, I want I should have asked this up front, just clarity on your definition of medtech, because you separate separate out diagnostics from, from medtech. Yes, I do. And so if so, basically, diagnostic tests, mm-hmm. R and D tools, and then sort of DX analytics, which is sort of actionable data that help clinicians make decisions okay. treating patients, are all in our DX tool sector. But if you have an imaging technology or a monitoring technology that's a actual device, um, then I put it into into device. Okay. So it is. It's it, it kind of a, a, you know it's a fine line sometimes of what is a device for what is versus what is a DX tool in my definitions. But yeah, that's kind of how we think about these things. So, so looking at the, the, the private M and a, it looks like it was down a bit from 20 and 18 and 17 and 19, 16 this year, you identified Medtronic and Stryker as two of the big buyers. You noted that Boston hasn't really acquired a company since 2018, but the thing that really popped out to me was the time to exit. I mean, you've been tracking this, how, how the, the, the number of years between, between investment or starting in the company, company and sale of the company. It's been in the sevens and the eights. Last year it was in 4.8, under five years for an exit. That's remarkable. Yeah. And so I think that's great. It's great news. And I think there's a couple things that are driving that. I think one is, you know, even on the 510K sort of uh, focused companies that are, that get to the market quicker, 
I think you're starting to see the device acquirers being intrigued and, and stepping up a little bit earlier to, to grab those companies. Mm-hmm. But we're also continue to see this, this sort of intriguing, you know, anti, uh, well, it's, it's against your, your sort of what you think on the PMA side, because typically the PMA are these brand new, you know, new novel devices that, you know, you would think would need to get to approval and some revenue ramp before acquirers would want to step in. But actually it's, it's more along the lines of if they see really interesting clinical data, they want to jump in to make sure they grab the technology before uh, their competitors get it. So in PMA, we actually see these companies get acquired before clinical, before uh, FDA approval a lot of the time. And actually, when we looked at, you know, four of the seven PMA deals this year exited in faster than 3.5 years from the close of Series A. So even though there's maybe a, a lot more inherent risk in a PMA product, you actually have the ability to get to exit in a faster uh, in a faster way than your traditional 510K. And you had hit in the last question in the past, you've tracked the returns on those PMA investments, making the argument that I believe they were actually providing a better uh, X return on investment than uh, than the supposedly safer 510K. Has that thesis continued? Is that holding true? It, it has. Um, I will say that when you do look at the the, the deal numbers this year, they're, they're pretty similar to what we saw in 2019, which is mm-hmm. kind of a step down from 2018. Mm-hmm. So when you think about uh, the overall deal values for like 510K, we saw uh, 80 million upfront median and 200 million total. And if you if you sort of compare that to where the the trend is from 2015 to 2019, it's it's less, you know, it's less than what we saw from that period of time, which was mm-hmm. 110 up front, 130 total. So PMA and is actually down as well versus overall trends over the last five years, but we're still seeing good, good activity. And I think what's interesting is you have to sort of take a leap of faith that a lot of the potential MA that we could have seen have gone public instead mm-hmm. because the valuations are so good and you're seeing all this performance. And frankly, if you think about it, you know, as I look at the 11 IPOs um, in device this year, eight of the 11 are valued at over a billion dollars wow. in market cap as of the end of the year. So even though you're seeing m and down, I think it's really a function of seeing some of the better companies go IPO and seeing great performance there. So um, wh- while, you know, it's not great to, to talk about m and being down, I think you have to sort of put it in conjunction with what's going on in the IPO market. Yeah, well, if you can point to a strong IPO market and point to the shorter paths to, to m and I think that's uh, hopeful signs for, for fundraising for venture funds in 2021. Yeah, and hopefully for device acquirers that are going to say, oh, yep. you know, these companies are, are going up so much post-IPO if I want to actually get in and get these companies, I better get get in as a private company before they go public. Yep. Because once they go public, we're seeing such amazing performance. So hopefully we'll also see some of these, these M&A transactions uh, uh, inch up next year and get bigger. Awesome. Great. John, thanks for taking the time today. I know you're busy. And uh, thanks for the report as always. My pleasure. Always good to talk with you, Tom. Thanks, John Norris, for the time and the data. Certainly found that conversation interesting and promising. So a uh, great way to start the new year. Next up, I want to uh, start my conversation with Rob Cowell. As I mentioned up top, Rob is the Vice President of Medical Affairs and the CMO of Cardiac Rhythm and Heart Failure Group at Medtronic. We spoke with Rob on December 22nd, once again, a few hours before my uh, my holiday break started. Rob is uh, brings a lot of energy to the conversation, a lot of passion for medical devices and for caring for patients. So I know you'll enjoy this conversation with Rob Cowell of Medtronic. Well, Rob Cowell, welcome to the podcast. Tom, it's great to be here. Rob, you must be uh, extraordinarily busy with all that's gone on with COVID this year, and I want to get into your work at Medtronic, but I'm always curious to, as to, to how someone makes that transition. Prior to uh, joining Medtronic in 2017, you were a practicing electrophysiologist at Baylor and uh, at other institutes before that. What uh, caused you to sort of make that leap from uh, from being a clinician to uh, to being an industry? You know, it's 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 fun. I think about this a lot. I, I started actually as a basic scientist, molecular genetics, and uh, a joint degree in medicine, but you know, quickly fell in love with with clinical practice. And there was you know, circa ninety five, ninety nine. There was no better place in medicine to tie technology 
procedures and science for the benefit of, set of, of a set of patients that really had no other options than EP. Mm-hmm. And so I just fell in love with it immediately. And, and as my career went on, um, I was drawn to a lot of opportunities to change things like workflow, like access to care. But the biggest one was technology development. So that's where, where I was drawn to, uh, particularly around the cryo balloon before Medtronic's um, acquisition of Cryocath. And then once I got to know Medtronic and working with them on the micro leadless pacemaker project. And so um, well, when the opportunity arose, it seemed like a natural next step for my career to to join Medtronic. That's a great point. Uh, just looking back at uh, in the 90s, there certainly was uh, a closer, I think, relationship between clinicians and physicians and, and engineers and entrepreneurs and the creations of new technology. Do you feel uh, over the 20 years you were practicing or so, did you feel that that there was sort of a separation uh, or some walls being erected between physicians and and entrepreneurs or innovators of new technology? You know, I think at least in EP, it's still as strong as ever. I think there there are some appropriate barriers around conflict of interest that have been put in place and compliance, and, and those are important to have. But I think what hasn't changed is this, this strong relationship, particularly on the innovation side, on the startup side, between these entrepreneurs with ideas and the clinicians that can kind of see the path towards, um, you know, an unmet need among patients and, and getting those into the clinical trials needed to kind of prove out their worth. And so that's remained really strong. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a really important aspect of Medtronic uh, right now that we keep that tie to, to people actually doing cases in EP. Excellent. I want to focus just one more question about your, your transition to, to Medtronic. I wondered for those who maybe find themselves in a position like this in the future, what uh, what were the pros and cons that you weighed? What was that internal conversation like for you? Because leaving medicine, I imagine, was was a big decision. It, it was it was huge. And, you know, first off, I'm someone who likes change and I like to change things up. I've, I've changed practices a bit a couple of times in the, in the kind of environment I was in. I also did different kinds of work with Heart Rhythm Society in our hospital. But, um, you know, you, you get to this point in your career where you're, you're good at what you do and you're comfortable and you got to be willing to get uncomfortable um, quickly in a change like that. And so what I miss the most, ironically, is not the procedures that I love, but the patients. Mm. I, I really miss that the most. I think what was really exciting was the learning potential. You know, you walk into a place like Medtronic, you are not the smartest person in the room anymore. <laughs> there's, there's, if, if, you, if you think you're going to be, you know, just check that at the door because you're going to learn from a ton of people very quickly. I think the other thing is, you know, medicine is local. And, you know, Medtronic is global and medicine, you know, there's a time constraint to it. You've got one-on-one patients for a while. Things that are developed at Medtronic may last 25 or 30 years. So it's, it's a bit of a different mindset and it's a lot of fun to have gone through that transition and thinking. Being a podcaster, I can say I've, I've never carried that burden of being the smartest person in a conversation. So <laughs> <laughs> it must be horrible, but, uh, but I, it, and prior to your switch, I was just reading your, your, your bio. It said that uh, while you were practicing, you were, as you mentioned, developing, you were developing quality metrics and protocols for not only improving care, but also reducing unnecessary costs. You were doing work with the Baylor Scott and White Quality Alliance, Alliance, the ACO. So, I mean, you've already, you were not just, you obviously patients were your priority, but you already had a sense of the business side of things, of, of, of processes and costs and saving money. Yeah. And, and I had it from that That other perspective, what was interesting when I came to Medtronic, and, you know, as you know, Medtronic has this very strong mission. Those conversations are just as strong in Medtronic. Whatever we do and produce has to lead to an outcome, has to have an outcome that's beneficial for patients, and has to contribute to a cost effectiveness um, for the system as a whole. So, you know, in reality, that aspect of it didn't change that much. It was just which perspective I was in when I was working. Well, let's let's fast forward to uh, to 2020, and fortunately, we're, we're fast forwarding it beyond it now. But it was quite a year. How your your focuses on remote heart monitoring on remote technologies? I mean, this seems like this was the I don't want to say opportunity. This was sort of the moment that this technology was really created for. What was 2020 like for you and for and for remote tech? Yeah, no, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. There, there, are a lot of what became relevant this year was already present. 
what what happened was there was a newfound urgency and need for its use. And so the way I like to think of that is, you know, Medtronic's often known for the technology, the, the, the innovation and the disruption in pacers or ICDs. But if you look back over time, there's this been this parallel innovation of how we actually communicate and get digital information into and out of those devices. And that's culminated now over 20 years into this year of 2020, where suddenly all those capabilities that were really secondary in the mind of most, most clinicians rose to this incredible prominence and importance. That's a, that's a great distinction. I mean, who who discovered the power of remote technology? Uh, 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 is it the physicians? Are they really the 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 demographic that you had to sort of win over and sway to to really uh, drive more uh, quicker adoption and, and faster change? Well, you know, actually, it, it I think it goes back to some really bold decisions years ago internal in the company. And again, this predates my my involvement. But, you know, if you look back to when a decision was made to set up a remote portal uh, like CareLink that we have, um, the online portal to get data, that those decisions were being developed in 1995 or so. Google didn't even exist at that time. And there was some vision that this was going to be the future. And then when you fast forward to um, the fact that our portfolio now, you know, can leverage um, uh consumer electronics through the use of low energy Bluetooth, that decision came in 2005 before mm-hmm. there was an iPhone, right? We were using Nokia, Nokia flip phones where you'd shut off the Bluetooth because <laughs> it was burning so much battery. And so, so all these things were being set up. Now, I think over time, the clinicians were using it and what they were doing was generating the clinical evidence that really supported the importance of the use and the further development of the, of the technology. Uh, it's amazing how things come together. So let's talk about the, just sort of the, 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 the state of remote heart monitoring for from your perspective through Medtronic's portfolios, or I guess what products have really been, have given, been given the opportunity to shine in this pandemic and have, have really come to the forefront? Yeah, I, well, I think the big thing has been that, um, Everything in the portfolio is now connected in remote monitoring in one form or another. And then the more recent aspect that now every there's at least one product across our entire portfolio that is Bluetooth enabled to enable that remote monitoring to now be leveraged um, through a consumer electronic device like an, an iPhone or, or an Android, certain specific Android phones as well. So that's the real the real game changer is on the patient side at least being able to connect to the device they use every day. Yeah, you know, I think the the way the way we like to think about this is, you know, if you think back over time, you'd get a pacemaker, you'd have to go to the office to get it checked. To get it reprogrammed in the early days, you had to stick, you know, a needle through the skin. And so and then, you know, even remote monitors when they first started, you'd send the patient a device and they had to open this package and set it up on their bedside and go through all the 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 setup. The idea now is I think with this platform, we're actually not bringing the patient to our world. We can deliver the device into their world. So they don't have to change anything. They they hook they they pair their device to their pacemaker and now their remote monitor is basically in their pocket. Um, mm-hmm. Where, wherever they go. And, and we've, seen, we've seen benefits on an individual basis and on a group basis out of that. So we just, we just reported at uh, the Heart Rhythm Society late breaker sessions from the scientific sessions uh, in May, an interesting study done out of Cleveland Clinic where they looked at um, kind of the adherence to scheduled remote transmissions. Really, this is the fidelity of remote monitoring to take that every three month check that should be done and make sure it does get done. And with traditional bedside monitoring, that's accomplished about 75 to 85% of the time. When we were on a Bluetooth device with the app, that went up into the mid to upper 90s um, routinely. So really this this higher fidelity of just connectivity. And we had a great story of how this translated. You know, this is one that, that really resonated for me. There was a patient story that, that, that came up to us where a patient was um, mowing their lawn and got incredibly fatigued and went inside and sat on the couch. About 30 minutes later, he got a phone call from the clinic that they recognized there was a problem. The pacemaker needed to be adjusted. 
And that was because the phone in his pocket had transmitted an alert up to the clinic that was discovered. Now, if that had been a traditional bedside monitor, you'd have had to go through that old system of either waiting till the patient went to the bedside and had that connection and the next morning, there'd be a, you know, an intervention, or they'd have to call the clinic, wait on hold and go through all the usual rigmarole that we do, you know, when we call, when we call the office kind of thing. That's amazing. No, and that's yeah. like Lee someone you're right, who, who would have, uh, just sat with it for a while and caught their breath yeah. and had a, a glass of lemonade or something. And, and going back to the, the the 75 to 80 percent, I mean, that sounds like like a good amount of people. It sounds like it caught more than three quarters of of the patients, or at least they were they were monitored. But that additional 15 to 18 percent, whatever the, that's a that's a lot of people. I mean, that that's a big a big change. Yeah, I I, th- I think it is it is a big change, and I think we're now going to understand how much incremental benefit that gives. And you know, if you look back at at the earlier studies of remote monitoring, really this started with this evolution of clinical evidence, just just like everything else we we do around the devices. Um, where you know, first question was, is it safe to move these these checks from the office to home? And the data said yes. And then then what we saw was wow, it's actually more efficient for the office and it's safer because you can get actionable data much faster than when you wait for an office visit or patient symptoms. Um, Then came these larger uh, registry studies where it looked like the the more remote monitoring any patient did, the more likely they were to avoid ER visits. If they went to the hospital, their stays were shorter. And even hints that those were a group of patients that lived longer. So, so I think there's every indication to what you said that the, as we push higher on this automated mo- remote monitoring, in addition to this alert monitoring, um, there sh- it should lead to positive benefits for patients. Uh, I'm sure as you start as a physician, when, some, when we go into our doctor's office, we swear up and down, we'll do this, that, and the other thing. And then we step out of the office and life takes over and you kind of forgot to do this and forgot to do that. Well, that's that's a great point. I think the power of this is you you know you don't have to remember to do it. It's going to happen in the background for you. That's great. So we're we've been we were we're looking at remote technology before COVID as up and coming. COVID has sort of really given an opportunity to to be on center stage. Hopefully, with vaccinations happening, we're moving to post COVID era. Do we maintain the the advances that we've we've made this year? Uh, and, and beyond, and, and what what does that world look like? Do we do we keep this connectivity? Do we are we going to have to go back and fight the same fights we were before? What what do you think happens next? You know, I, I think a good a good chunk of this stays because um, people have recognized the benefits. Right? You, you know, it people have been forced to make change, and sometimes when you make the change, you realize, wow, I, I should have done this already. Um, and so, if you look at just remote monitoring of patients, what we saw in March and April timeframe at a time when, you know, as you know, implants were way down. We were skyrocketing in conversion over to remote monitoring to, to you know, hundreds of these a day uh, requests to add in. Um, I think the other place where we've seen change in how people operate that I think will stick is around what we call distance programming. So, Um, Our new programmer platform, which is based, again, using Bluetooth through an iPad Pro, has the ability to leverage Bluetooth so that that programming can be done, you know, outside the EP lab through the window as opposed to being right there. Mm -hmm. Well, who would have cared about that, you know, nine months ago? Now that makes a difference uh, in minimizing the number of people in a room. And that changes workflows. And those workflows in a lot of places are going to stick. The other place was with our legacy programmer, what we call 2090, there's a a capability to set up a remote connection to between a laptop and a 2090 um, through a secure single access um, uh, connection to control it remotely. So again, no one really thought much about that, you know, as early as February of this year, but now how is that being done? Well, we had a case of a, a micro implant, leadless pacemaker implant in Hawaii, where the rep was supporting the case um, from California wow. because they couldn't get there. Now, so people in the lab had every ability to override and take control, but that was the additional support they needed for everyone to be comfortable to go ahead. And the other place where we're now seeing this is in the MRI suite. So, 
you know, you'd go for an MRI, you have a pacemaker, you'd have to wait till a rep came or someone with programming capability came to adjust the device, get your scan, and then, and then turn around and, and, you know, reprogram it afterwards. Now we can use this capability to do this um, remotely without any delay, essentially on, on demand. And so I think those type of workflows, which were difficult to get in place, you know, pre-COVID will stick because people see that they work. What are or are there any hurdles remaining? We've talked about patient adoption. We've talked about physician awareness. Payers, I guess, are the third the third demographic that we need to have buy in to this and need to, to help push it into widespread adoption. Are, are the payers in line or are there any other, any other groups that I'm missing that might slow us down? You know, fortunately right now, um, this falls into the same payment codes as traditional remote monitoring. You know, we are venturing into a new area with the latest implantable loop, loop recorder linked to with remote programming. So with that device, through the app and CareLink, you can actually change the entire programming of the device. Now, you know, we'll eventually work to take that into our therapeutic devices. Clearly, there's a lot of work around security timing to be done, but then there'll be a whole new realm of kind of um, reimbursement and acceptance of that because there's a there's differences between interrogation and actually changing care and, and through reprogramming that we'll work through. But I think those are all all things that will evolve with, with the technology as it does as well. Mm-hmm. And my final question, and you alluded to it briefly, um, and I was going to ask it anyway, though, at, the, at this moment when we're talking, we're talking about hacks and security. What steps is, is Medtronic taking to ensure that uh, that connection is secure and safe? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I, I think there this is something we take incredibly seriously. So cybersecurity is part of the design process from the inception of any device um, uh, now, just like any other aspect of reliability and safety would be. So that's number one. Um, you know, secondly, by going to these consumer platforms, we can leverage the, the very robust privacy and security that comes with those and then add on top of that. And then thirdly, we do a lot of internal work constantly checking um, um, for any um, hint that there's you know, any kind of intrusion into the systems, which fortunately we've never seen. But we also work with a lot of the external um, groups that monitor these devices. So if, if there's a vulnerability that's, that uh, is, is hinted at or concerned, uh, if there's concern about, you know, we work with a group like that to try to reproduce it and see if there's a patch or, 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 or some kind of programming change that needs to be done to prevent that from being exploited at any time in the future. Any, I, I always do this, I say a final question, but I'm just curious, any, any long-term uh, projections or predictions as to what we might see in, in two or three years that's going to completely blow my mind? Well, I, you know, I don't know if this is mind-blowing per se, but, but um, I, I think where this platform can take us is really interesting. So right now we get information out of the devices. A little bit goes back to, to patients. I think there's a lot more opportunity to kind of mix the, the phone platform where you can ask patients questions, tie those patient reported outcomes to the objective data from the device and really deliver a robust package of information to the clinic much more efficient, efficiently. There'll be ways to get information that really benefits a patient and what they need to know or want to know uh, about their device in a, in, a, in a more seamless way. I think I think this will revolutionize how we do clinical trials. Um, you know, the days of ten-page case report forms may go by the wayside when we have these platforms um, and can leverage those with either internal or even some of the existing kind of Apple Research Kit and other other tools uh, that are out there. You know, I, I think in the end, you know, five ten years ago we were all talking that, that cardiac implantable devices were a mature market, not much happening, and I think between the technology and the devices and then this digital uh, interconnectivity with the dy- dynamic nature of these devices, I-, I don't think it's mature anymore. I think it's a, a spry, young, you know, young area once again. It's, kind of, it's a lot of fun to be working. <laughs> That's in great. Nice, nice fountain of youth. It will be great. Make a great title for the podcast. Dr. Rob Cowell, thanks for uh, joining us on the podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure to do this with you. 
All right. Well, it's always great to hear from Medtronic. Now is the time, Chris, where we uh, ask people, nay, beg people to uh, connect with us on social media. So uh, I'm going to go first this time. You always get to go first. I, I can't go first. I am on Twitter. I am at MedTechTom on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn, Tom Salemi. And of course, I know you're all waiting to hear how to uh, reach out to uh, my podcast partner, Chris Newmarker. Chris, where can they find you? Yes. Last but not least, you can uh, you can reach uh, <laughs> you can reach me on LinkedIn, uh, Chris Newmarker, just like a new marker, and I'm also on Twitter at Newmarker. Always happy to you know to discuss uh, discuss stories, discuss what's up around the industry. And while you're on social media, also connect with our Facebook Device Talks, Mass Device, and Medical Design and Outsourcing pages. We'd love to have you uh, connected to us there, so you can follow our coverage of this awesome medtech industry. And that's a wrap of this episode, the first episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast of 2021. Tune in next week. We will have another great episode of this podcast waiting for you. Woo! 2021!